There we go. Okay. So today I would like to say something about networks, which are important in epidemic modeling, which is a subject that we have been saying a lot about and the, the, the course is about. So last time we looked at, you know, if we have some data, we want to fit a curve, a function to the data. We want to, in other words, find parameters. So we had a function that looked something like some function which had parameters A and B and some input X. We want to know how does that compare to some data. So the data was of the pairs of the form X, I, Y, I. And so what we decided to do was take F at X, I, how far is that from the date? You know, this is the prediction from the data. If we assume that the model is correct with the current values of the parameters A and B, and how far is that from the data? And we decided we could square that, for example, as one example of something, a way of measuring how far away they were and sum them all up over all of the data. <clears throat> and then that's going to give us a function that is a function of the two parameters, which we'll call the loss function. And the measures some kind of distance. It's not an actual distance in the mathematical sense, but it's, uh, it sort of almost is. Uh, and so it measures some kind of discrepancy, if you like, between the prediction and the data. And then what we're going to do is tweak the parameters, right? Nudge, move the parameters a little bit so that the curve shifts and then uh, it gets closer to the data. And so if we keep doing that and nudging it, shifting it a bit each time, uh, if we do it in the correct way, we can converge to something which is best fitting the data, best approximating the data in the class of functions that we're looking at. And as we said, that is the basis of machine learning. We did this linear regression example, but we sort of did it by hand. We didn't, you know, the code is what you're writing in problem set five, which is due by the way tomorrow. You have to submit it tomorrow night by tomorrow night so that, you know, we can, um, so your grades are actually, we have to submit your grades by Friday, this Friday, this week. So that's why we need, need you absolutely to submit it by tomorrow. So just make sure you just do as much, do what you can without getting stressed about it, right? So it's a difficult, you know, it's a difficult time in general. And then I know people have a lot of different exams and projects and things. So just do what you can, submit what you can, don't stress. And then if you didn't manage to finish it, just once your exams are all, you know, once finals are all over, just come back and finish it sort of for fun, I would suggest. Okay. So today, I want to say a little bit about something that uh, probably should have mentioned a bit earlier, which is development tools. So tools for developing. What do I mean by developing? I basically mean writing code, so coding. So uh, I'm just going to mention three in particular, uh, but I won't say anything more about them right now. I'll say something in a minute, and then we'll look at um, networks. How do networks come into uh, what is a network and how does it play a role in modeling? And um, I'd like to say a little, just a little tiny bit about a couple of actual models that have been released very recently that are sort of the model, you know, what do, we've been doing these models that look sort of simple and I wouldn't say stupid, but sort of look simple and naive. How different are they from real world models, you know, real models that the sort of world experts are publishing today to model the actual, you know, current COVID crisis uh, and that are having impact in the decisions being made by political leaders, the erroneous decisions often being made by political leaders. <clears throat> anyway, so. It's a science class, not political science. <laughs> right, and they're making, they're, they're making judgments which are not informed by the science, that's what I'm saying. Okay. I'm not touching that one. Say that again? <laughs> I'm not touching that one. Yes. But, I'll, I'll refrain from saying anymore. But I have to admit, I did enjoy the Saturday Night Live last Saturday night. But anyway, I'm anyway. not going there either. Okay, so um, we've been using this Jupyter Notebook. So, you know, hopefully you think it's a pretty great tool. What is it a great tool for? It's a great tool for doing interactive explorations. But you may have realized that, well, you've had to write quite a lot of code for the problem sets. And maybe it's not such a hot tool if you're actually writing a lot of code. Right, because the code ends up getting split between different places in the notebook and it gets out of order and it's not clear what you've already run and eh. 
and then the tools may be not great. So, you know, what happens if you want to sort of jump to where a function is defined or you want to debug your code, etc. right? So there are some other options that we haven't mentioned yet. And so what do you, what do you want? You, you probably want some kind of text editor, right? So a programmer specifically for coding, a programmer's text editor, for co a coding editor, a code editor, if you like, that is designed. It must be designed to be able to be used with Julia, not necessarily designed for Julia, but you know, some general purpose text editor, code editor, but then there is a sort of some kind of module or plugin that actually knows about Julia, right? So it knows what the syntax of Julia is, it knows what the rules, some kind of rules in Julia are, and hopefully it can actually run the code, right? So you want to be able to run the code while you're working on it as well. And so, you know, it has, you have some kind of, kind of requirements for what a, uh, what a tool should look like. So there are some options, right? There are zillions of options now, right? So if you're used to using Emacs or Vim, which are these sort of venerable text editors that have been around for 30 years, you can use those with Julia. They have packages that you can modules that you can install to have syntax highlighting and all kinds of nice things. But if you're not used to using those, then here are some sort of more modern options, if you like. So there's one called Jupyter Lab. So that is from the same team, basically, as the Jupyter Notebook that we've been using, but it's sort of a more modern version. It's an up-to-date, let's say, version. Right, so the Jupyter Notebook was this kind of rev revolutionary idea in 2013 when it was released, I think, or 2012, which was, okay, instead of having a sort of terminal and a text editor and a plot window and a this, I'll just sort of integrate that all into this one document. So that's not actually an, a, an original idea. The original idea was basically Mathematica in 1988 or something. Um, had that already, but the difference is that this is open source and you can actually use it. Well, later on they realized, so in fact, that it was originally written for Python, it was called IPython, but later on they realized, well, actually uh, this interface that we've developed, this notebook interface, is, it's nothing to Python per se, right? It's just an interface that you can use for doing any kind of computational work. And it just has a sort of little text box where whatever you type in there gets sent to a process that is actually running the code. So that process I is- I don't think it was a, it was, there was much computing. time. And they realized that actually you could use any kernel for any programming language. And Julia was actually the, um, Julia was, at, well, I'm getting, some kind of automatic. Um, well, this, your sound uh, is kind of sometimes deteriorating. Sorry. Okay, so uh, yeah, so Julia was actually the first kernel that was written that was not a Python one. So yeah, I was going to say that I think it happened rather yeah. quickly, if I recall. I was in that. 2013. I was I was present physically present while Stephen Johnson, who's a professor at MIT, and Jeff Pizanton, who used to be Alan's. Uh, PhD student and is the you know uh, and Stefan Karpinski, so two of the other founders of Julia, were at this IPython developers meeting writing this kernel, um, and it's uh, yeah anyway. So now you can use this notebook with like a hundred different languages. But then uh, a couple of years ago, they, you know people have been complaining about things in the notebook for a while, and they realized they would have to rewrite it from scratch, and they came up with this thing called Jupyter Lab, and so it's literally is a lab, sort of a coding lab in the sense that it has a lot more facilities than are not present in the original Jupyter Notebook. For example, you can just open a Julia file and code. So, so it's a web-based web -based platform. And so you can actually code sort of inside a web browser, but with all the facilities of a, most of the facilities of a, of a modern coding editor. But then, so I'll show that in a minute. And then Juno, so that is, um, has been as Juno is a plugin for Julia inside an editor called Atom. So the, this is an editor that was de developed at GitHub. So there's a question about whether it's still going to be developed, but right now Juno is a very uh, very good option for developing Julia code. There's another platform called VS Code, Visual Studio Code, which is Microsoft developed, but it's open source, uh, which is also a very good option that I haven't used very much, so I won't say anything about it. And I want to say something about literates.jl as well. So what that, that enables you to do is type in a .jl file, which is a Julia code file that we'll see in a minute. And then you can actually create a Jupyter notebook from that file. 
automatically. So you, the point is that the structure of a Julia notebook file itself, as you may have realized sometimes, is, a, is, is pretty crazy. It is pretty difficult to work with. Okay, so I'm just going to quickly show all of these options, hopefully. Um, so I should have probably done this at the start of the class, but anyway. So Jupyter Lab, let me try and get that working. Uh, so you can install that using the iJulia package, just like you installed the notebook. You just type Jupyter Lab parentheses, and it, it will work. So it looks like this. We we only see your slides at the moment. That's correct. You do. Sorry. Thank you. So it looks like this. So this is inside my web browser, and you can see that there's something that looks very much like the Jupyter notebook, but a bit more modern, a bit cleaner. And now over here, I have sort of a side panel that I can close and, and reopen with like a list of commands and then as other things and a list of um, what I have open and a list of files that I could open if I wanted to. And so you use it just like you use the Jupyter Notebook, but it's just sort of much more agile. And then for example, I can go file new, ah, file new. So I don't just have terminals. I actually have a console of like a, you know, uh, so I, I can select which kind of language I want. So I can either have Python, which we don't want obviously, <laughs> or Julia. And so, what does it do? Does it do this? Oh yeah, there we go. So it's sort of starting up an actual terminal inside my browser somehow. I don't know why it's taking so long. Anyway, so let's go instead for a text file. So now I'm, I'm actually have a text file. I can start typing Julia code. And if I save it, okay, so this is not working very well. But anyway, you get the idea. The point is I can actually edit text inside my browser in a file. Right? Okay. Anyway, so, okay, I just wanted to show that. So, and I'm going to show Atom. This is an, an editor that looks much more like a standard text editor. So here is actually the source code of today's lectures, right? So this is a markdown file. So, but instead I'm going to create a new file and I'm going to save it with some file name like test.jl. And just save it somewhere, wherever. Uh, test2.jl, whatever. Oh, come on. Stupid Zoom is always getting in the way. Save it there. It doesn't really matter. Okay. So now if I, I, I type code, it looks nice. It's doing syntax highlighting. You know, I can define a function and, and whatever else. And it, it sort of knows this to indent. Uh, x equals x plus one, you know, whatever, return x. And the point is, if I do shift enter, it actually executes that code on that line and prints out the result here, right? So if I do f of x, and then I say f of x, and x is this global variable up here, right? Don't use global variables, but if you do use them, this is how it would look, then you get four, right? And so it's actually printing out the result right here. And so if I do something like rand of five, five, I execute that with shift enter, it tells me, oh, that's a 555 array, but you see it has this little arrow. If I click that, I actually see the array, right? And then I click it again and it goes away and I can click this X and it hides that whole output. So it's really neat because you have this text editor, right? If I highlight all of that and copy it and paste it, it does not paste the results. It knows that the results are sort of different. So it is a real text editor, but it also enables you to do this inline evaluation. And then I can open a terminal down here and I can just use it as, as a sort of normal Julia terminal. And also uh, I can open a variable, a thing called a workspace, open workspace. And you can see, hopefully, no, you can't, why not? Yeah, of course, nothing ever works when you try and do a demo, but um, it's supposed to show me all of the variables that I have in my workspace right now. And it's for some reason not doing that for me. Sorry about that. And then there's also a debugger that I don't think I want to go through all of this right now, but there is a debugger that you can use that, that was a big uh, advance recently, or maybe last year, that now you can actually debug Julia. That's a very difficult thing to do because of the technical way that Julia is built. But now you can. So you can step through your code, you can set a breakpoint that it'll stop at when it reaches that point, and you can inspect the variables Maybe I should just show that actually, just quickly. So, uh, so you do Juno dot Juno dot at at enter 
f of x. And it'll load up the debugger. So the first time it'll just take a little bit to compile. And then you can see that um, there's a little debug panel over here. And you're supposed to, again, see these. I'm going to actually quit Atom and load it again. Let me just see if I can see this workspace. I don't understand why it's not working. Oh, we're still waiting to start Julia for some reason. There we go. So this is a list of all the variables that are in my world. So now if I do x equals x plus one, you can see that um, this three should change to four. So it's just taking a while because it's still compiling stuff. There we go, and it changed to four. Right, and I, if I do r equals round of five five, it'll add my variable r in there, and I can click on here as well in my variable explorer. I can see the values as well, and it tells me what kind of object each of these things is. So now let's do the um, what I did before. So function f of x, sort of x equals x plus g of x, um, return x, I guess, and then I'll do another function g of x over here. What does that do? It does sort of x equals x plus one, return x. And now I'll do x equals x plus three, and I'll do sort of x equals three, Juno dot at enter g of x. And so now, here we are, here we are. It's put this cursor inside here, and look what happened. There's an x over here, which is three. There's an x inside g, right? It says g over here, and this is main. Main is like the global space. Here's g, and it has x equals three. And I'm gonna step to the next line, so of course they've changed the interface since the last time I used this. Uh, so let's say next line. The next line is here. You see x changed in here. You can see that x, the value of x in g changed, but the value of x in main has not changed. So you actually have different um, you know, values. And so, and what I did not manage to do was, oh, I'm sorry, f depends on g. Yeah, so uh, I should actually, so let's get out of this and, and let's go into f instead. So we're in F now, so you can see we're in F, and I'm gonna step into G. So how do I do that? Step into, yeah. So there we go, now we're in G, and you can see that there's a copy of X in F, a copy of F, X in G, and now if I go to the next line, then the one in G changed, the one in F has not yet changed. If I go to the next line, I'm back in F, and the one in F now has uh, not yet changed because I'm still on that line, and I go to the next line, and now F has changed, if the X has changed inside F and not yet outside, etc. right? So it's very cool. And you can, yeah, there are other things you can do, like I can um, say, okay, oh, I, don't, I want to know about this RAND uh, thing, so I'm gonna type command J, command D, or con control J, control D, and it'll open a documentation panel where actually it renders the documentation nicely. So it's, it's really pretty cool. Uh, it's a pretty complete sort of integrated development environment for Julia. You can even, for example, do this, oh, you know, that code, my professor's not gonna like the way that's formatted, so I'd better format it. So I'm gonna hit this button. It looks like a bit of skew code. And if I'm lucky, it will actually format that nicely once it has, again, the first time you run each of these things, it's gonna compile it, and there it is, it's formatted nicely, right? So um, there's no excuse for submitting badly formatted code any, ever a, anymore. Okay, so that was a little taste of Juno. And now let's look at literate. So, um, so what does literate do? So it's a Julia package. This is a, like a Julia terminal. Can you read that? Uh, and what I'm gonna do is, uh, sorry, I need to make a text file first. So let's just uh, write a little text file. So uh, let's call it hello.jl. So this is, so any Julia file ends in .jl for, for Julia. So I'm gonna open that in my, editor in my atom my my atom editor and i'm going to start typing so it knows it's julia because it has this dot jl right so um i'm going to type a comment and i'm going to put another hash right and now i'm going to type a comment and this is some text so there's one uh, one hash for a comment and then a, another hash that's going to give me a, a header in markdown 
And I'm going to even put, uh, maybe I can put some LaTeX in there, probably, y equals x squared. And then I'm going to put some Julia code, right? So function f of x, return x plus 1. Okay, that's, that's, my, that's my file. And now what I'm going to do is go back to literate. So I'm going to open literate. I'm going to open Julia, load literate.jl. So it's called literate because there's this idea of literate programming. So literate programming means you write some code, but you document the code. But how do you document the code? You document it by writing prose, by writing actual like flowing text. So here's this flowing text that's supposed to document what I'm doing. And now another literate programming environment is the Jupyter Notebook. I want to convert this into a Jupyter Notebook. But as I said, yeah, well, yeah. So let's convert this into a Jupyter Notebook. So literate.notebook of hello.jl. So I can use tab completion on that file name, and I need to actually put that I want it to be in the current directory. So I uh, put current directory is dot. And so it wrote a notebook file, right? So now I'm going to go and open my notebook. So I have a shortcut JNB to open my notebook in the current directory. Because I use it so much. And now I'm going to look for the notebook called hello.ipymb and open it. And that's what it looks like. It looks like a real Jupyter notebook that's just been created straight from this literate.jl text, right? And it tells me it was generated using literate.jl. Isn't that cool? So, um, and then there is a way to go backwards. So if you have a notebook, you can go back to the literate.jl input. And then what is the point? Why, why, do I, why am I bothering to write it in this um, you know, annoying way instead of writing it in a nice notebook? And the answer is, well, what do the, what do the files look like? So this was the original file, hello.jl looks like this it's just very readable you know, just it's a bit annoying that i have to put comments on every line you know but it's very readable now let's look at the notebook that was produced and it's this complete nonsense right so this is a particular format called json which stands for javascript object notation as you can tell well it has a lot of information but it's information that i don't care about as a user right so it's telling you me okay this is a cell here this is a a cell in Jupyter, the cell type is marked down, the source of that cell is this, etc. right? So um, it's a very annoying format to, to work with. And so that's why we prefer to use simple formats and then convert. Oh, so, so I have a question. I can write code that generates like random notebooks. Like suppose I wanted every student in a class to have a slightly different problem set. Like, yeah. you know, like, cool. like, like different numbers or- Yeah, you, know, you can problem. do that, sure. Yeah, you can just so, programmatically generate 30 notebooks or 300 notebooks, yeah, with different different numbers in the in the problems. Sure. That's a good idea. Yeah, I mean, I've been to talks where people do that, not with notebooks, but you could do it with a notebook now. Yeah. Good question. Okay. So that's all I think I wanted to say about tooling. Does anybody have any questions? So I keep, keep losing all my windows. Uh, where am I? Notebook. No. Oh, I see it on my tablet. That's why I answered it. Yeah. Okay. Good. So let's move on to something. So this is important. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's one more thing I want to say, which is, okay, now I have some, if I have some code in a .jl file, how do I include it, right? So if you had written your problem set N, which has all this code, you had written that, you know, you had written some functions, basically, right? All Julia code should be structured as small functions that call each other. So now I have a collection of small functions in what you basically have produced your own little library, right? You produced a library for simulating an agent-based model of epidemic spread. And now let's call it agents.jl. And now, you know, so uh, now I want to include that in my notebook so that I can do my interactive exploration and do my, you know, nice manipulation. So by the way, at manipulate does work inside Juno. That's kind of cool. Um, but I wanted to use the notebook for whatever reason. Or, or I want to use Juno, but I just want to have the code separately in some other file. I just do it. So the simplest way to do it is include in the file name. And that will copy, basically, that will bring in all the code and put it right there as if I had just typed it right there. So um, that's what include does. So that is different from what we've been using, which is using, right? So you, if, if I had a package called agents, then I could do using agents. So how do you create a package in Julia? What is a package? It's just, um, a, it's basically a folder, a directory on your computer that has a particular structure in particular. It has to have a directory called src. So a package 
the directory containing an src source subdirectory and that which contains sort of itself contains a file in this case will be called agents.jl so the name of this has to match the name of this file i think and that in turn contains what's called a module so what is a module it would be something like this module agents right so in and inside this module comes whatever i want to put in the in this sort of world right so you know i have struct agent um whatever i wanted to put in there x which is an integer etc and then i need an n for my module so once i've defined that what do i have i have this thing called agents and everything inside what there's agents i access by putting agents dot something so agents dot agent is this struct for example right so obviously that's annoying and that's why i do using agents sorry and i need using dot agents uh, dot means that it's like in the current sort of universe or something right and so now i can just refer to agent no i can't i oh, know i can't because oh damn because what i need to do is export anything that i want to be able to access once i've done using anything i want to be able to access i need to explicitly write export inside the module but usually you put it at the top in fact but now of course if i rerun this it'll say oh no i thought i was going to give me an error but yeah it just gives me a warning so it replaced agent. So now, because I exported it, when I do using agents, I can actually talk about agent. And so that is the structure of a Julia package. That's all it is. It is a set of files inside this source directory, inside some folder. Usually you want tests as well, you want other documentation, but all you really need is this. And so you can actually make your own little packages that you can, can write with using just like this. Okay, so that replaces include. So include is when you don't have a package structure and using is when you do so no package structure. So that's like where you, where you would start off. Right. But then it turns out that Julia has some nice tools for, for using uh, modules. So for example, that in particular, there's a package called, so if you're going to do a lot of development, you actually want to use a package called revise. You want to do using revise and that will, um, this is a, key tool for package development what it will do is if you change something inside one of your packages that you load after doing after you load revise then it will actually reload the new code and that's a very very useful tool okay so I'm, i know it's been very very fast but i just wanted to sort of expose you to a bit of the you know, the next step, right? So because we're finishing this course, but hopefully you're not finishing your voyage, your journey with Julia. And so, you know, you're going to encounter some of these things and you're going to want to write bigger bits of code, then you want a, a better tool to do this. Okay. So I think we'll stop there with the tooling. Okay. So uh, let me share my, my other thing again. So, okay, so let's talk about networks. So what is a network and why do I care? So in our simulations that we've done in the problem sets, we've had agents and those agents have lived, you know, either we haven't even said where they live and they just sort of can touch everybody else or they have lived on some kind of square grid so I've had an agent that looks like that, but the agent and the, there's another agent over there. And, but these agents only interact when they touch. And when do they touch? Well, this agent moved at one step to that site. And then at the next step, maybe it tried to move to that site. And then when they kind of collided, when they tried to collide, that was when they had this opportunity to transmit the infection. So we have some kind of contact via touch or via physical contact. And of course, that is a very reasonable model for an actual epidemic. Most actual epidemics are transmitted by physical contact, although not necessarily, right? Because people say that COVID lives, I mean, it is by physical contact in some sense. Well, not even, right? I mean, if you sneeze on somebody, that's, it's a sort of physical contact. 
or if you touch touch a door handle and they come come along two days later and they touch the same door handle that's another kind of physical contact but it's kind of delayed and so is that a good way of modeling so maybe not so much right so what is the other way that we can model instead of so instead of having these things move around and bump into each other what other way can we represent uh, this modeling process? Because if people want to um, put something in the chat. Sorry, represent this contact, like this infection. How does an infection get transmitted? We want to model that somehow, right? We want to say this person is capable of transmitting the disease to this person, the infection to this person. Can not not quite sure what question you're asking. Yeah, I'm asking, uh, okay, I'm asking, okay, so, um, so this thing is moving, so I, we've so far had people moving around in space, and when they, in, you know, when they hit each other in space, in the same place, that is when they can transmit the infection. But now I'm asking, can we step back from that and try and represent in a slightly more abstract way, who can I infect? You mean somebody within, six, somebody within six feet of me? Well, okay, so somebody within six feet of me, but then maybe I go to the supermarket and then I can infect all those people. So I could represent that by, I physically move my agent in the simulation to a place called the supermarket. What would the, but that's, you know, what I'm saying is, can we make that a bit more abstract and represent that in a slightly different way? So we have to represent that I'm somehow infecting the supermarket and then the supermarket kind of has some infection and infects the other people that are there in some sense. So how could we represent that? So there's a hint in the title of the slide, right? Yeah, encoding a graph, yeah. So I'm gonna represent the contacts between people as networks or graphs. Well, that is the same thing, a network and a graph, right? But gra the word graph is sort of rather overused in mathematics. So, you know, it means different things to different people. And the word, so, you know, it's different communities. It, graphs are sort of the word that mathematicians tend to use and networks are uh, sort of what everybody else tends to use. I mean, just as a very general, you know, um, characterization, that's not of course exactly true. Okay, so they're the same thing. So what is a network or a graph? This is an example of one, this square grid, right? So it's just, so, the network is just this. So it's some vertices or points or nodes and some edges that are joining them. So maybe this is joining that to that and that to that and that to that and that to that and, that to that, and this one doesn't have any, right? So that is an example of a network. So what does that represent? It represents that in some sense there is a contact or some interaction, right, between these ones that have edges. And those edges could also have more information on, for example, this is a very strong one and this is not such a strong connection, right? So they have, can have weights as well. And they can also have arrows. So that one in, in fact can infect that one, but not the other way around. That would be called a directed network or a directed graph. So there, there's, there's, you know, people have been studying these for things for, mathematicians have been studying these things for, I don't know, 100 years or something, 50 years. And um, then sort of everybody else has got into the, the, the business more recently, although, well, physicists have been doing special kinds of networks for a long time. So like this kind of network, which is called a square grid or a lattice, right? If I have a person there, they can only interact with their neighbors, north, south, east, and west. And so physicists have been doing that kind of, I mean, that's like a crystal structure. And so they've been thinking about that kind of interaction for 150 years or more, I don't know. So, so that's what a network is. So you can see that that is a way of representing, okay, if I have a link with somebody, that means I can infect them, right? Why? Because they're my friend, and so I go and visit them, you know, every week. And so there's some, um, uh, and so, you know, I could, of course, I can represent that as, you know, I have my agent get in their car and, you know, in a SimCity kind of, world if you know that uh, game they literally drive along some road and they get out of their car and they go into the person's house of course i can represent it like that but that's a lot of work right it's easier to just say i have a connection right a link some kind of 
not physical thing, but just a, a connection represented in, in, in this way that's saying, oh yes, I have some probability to transmit an infection. If I have an infection, I might have some probability that some kind of, or if you like some rate, if you're thinking in continuous time, to transmit this infection over to that person. Is that clear? So this is just a sort of more abstract way of representing who, what is the world of individuals with whom I can interact. And so you might have special kinds of interactions with you know, a hospital or a supermarket. So here's a supermarket. So everybody needs to go and shop, right? So I have sort of a different kind of link from each individual to the supermarket. And that link is probably saying, yeah, that, that it's just sort of probably some different weight, right? It's just a different probability. I don't go to the supermarket very often, but if I'm there, maybe I have a higher pro probability to in, get infected or something. So that's sort of, you can, so I'm not, I don't want to go into the details of how we might actually, you know, model that interaction. That is the hard bit, right? So this is actually the kind of thing that they are doing in this Imperial College model. So if you've heard, if you've been following the news, you'll, you'll know maybe that there is a group at Imperial College, a very famous university in London, uh, which is led by a guy called Neil Ferguson, who is one of the world's top epidemiologists. And um, so he has, a, he developed 15 years ago, some code to model SARS, I believe, outbreaks, this uh, outbreak in, the, in Asia of a respiratory coronavirus in cause disease. So he resurrected that code and applied it to this, co this new coronavirus um, scenario. And then there's been a whole lot of discussion because he did not Im immediately release the code. And he's now released a cleaned up version that well, I'm going to show you a bit because uh, somebody asked for that and I thought it was a really good idea. Um, right, that, that this is like, th and this is the model that convinced the UK governments to um, stop their policy of not doing anything and to start having people be in lockdown. So it's a very important, you know, piece of code actually. And so uh, you might imagine that it's a lot more complicated than what we've been doing in this course. And of course it is a lot more complicated, sort of, it's a lot more code because there's a very complicated model because they have supermarkets and schools and offices and they have, a um, yeah, well, I'll talk about it a bit more later. But actually the conceptual basis of the code, of like the model rather, the conceptual basis is just this picture and couple that with what we've been doing in the problem sets and that's all. So really there's nothing more to it than what we've done. You could go and write that code yourself. So the difficult bit is, you know, why, why can you have to be a professional epidemiologist is where do you get the data from? How do you interpret the data? How do you convert that into a realistic model that you can code up in this way, right? That is the difficult bit actually, not, not really the actual writing the code in a way. So of course I, that's not quite true because you know, it's, it's not obvious how, so, so I'm gonna discuss a bit, how do you actually code a network in Julia? That will, will come to a bit. And so what I'd like to advertise is that we have a proposal for a, um, Alan, is it a super Europe? Is that right? You there? No. Okay. Can you hear me actually? Can anybody hear me? I can't see anything at all. Okay. Can, Jeremiah, can you hear me? Okay, cool. So yes, we have a proposal, which I believe is a super Europe for actually converting this Imperial College code into Julia and like rewriting it completely. So if anybody's interested in that, please do get in touch. Because I think- I Remind everybody that there are, um, on the Hacker Heaven site, there are any number of um, Julia related um, proposals out there and we probably will get some funding for this. So even though um, the summer funding deadline has passed, we probably will get some funding. And so um, if you enjoyed this sort of stuff and want to do more of it, just contact us. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. So basically we're representing these contacts implicitly, as I said, just by this, like a link means I have a probability to, you know, I can, I can infect that person. And then there's probably some weight, some, some strength on this link, some number that tells me how likely or what rate am I infecting people. Right. So, yeah, as I said, okay, so how do, how do we represent this on the computer? Okay, so 
I think we're just going to jump straight over to the, do a notebook. Okay, uh, so I need to share this really screen. Okay, and now I have a notebook right there, but let's go and get it in the right directory. Chat questions. Why is it being translated into Julia? We're about to see that. Is it for performance? Good question. So no, it is not for performance because it's, it was written in C originally, which is a very fast language, and it's now written in C++, which is a very fast language. So if it's not perform for performance, then what is it? And um, so we'll see that in a minute when we look at the model code. We're actually gonna look at some code. Okay, so I'm just gonna make a new notebook. And of course, I'm in the completely the wrong directory. So we're going to see, you know, a bit of how to represent a, no a network in Julia. But before we do that, let's just think about actually the sort of bonus question, the extra credit question from problem set four. So, so what I asked you to do was to say, okay, let's just take a square grid of size 20 by 20, say. So L is 20 and M is just zeros. It's gonna have integers inside of 20 by 20. And I'm gonna put some agents in there. So I'm gonna put N agents. So let's say N is 50. Okay. And then I'm gonna put them in at random positions in the, well, okay, I'm not gonna do it like that. I'm actually gonna do a density. So let's say rho is 0 0.1. That's going to be the density of agents. So can anybody think of a good way of putting agents with that density on this grid? So you did that in one of the problem sets, right? I asked you to go through and choose a position and put one there, and, but you had to check if there was nobody else there already. And so that's the way you have to do it if you want exactly n agents. But instead of exactly n agents, it's actually easier to do a density of agents. So there's like a probability of an agent being at a particular site. So how could I actually do this? So uh, we don't have that much time, so maybe I'll just do it. So um, I'm gonna do rand of, uh, you know, um, I'm gonna generate some random numbers basically for each site, rand of L and L, sorry, there should be L, no magic numbers, please. Can you always give a name to all your numbers, right? So I'm gonna do rand of L, L, that gives me random numbers, and I'm gonna check if that is less than P, is less than rho, my density. And I'm going to do that at each site. And that's going to give me, so this is broadcasting, so it's going to give me an array of trues and falses, zeros and ones. And the ones are where the agents go. And so basically, I'm just going to do m, you know, um, dot equals that. And now m contains all of those values. Okay, the, those are the, 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 the ones are where the agents are. And so, of course, as usual, we don't want to just see this matrix. We actually want to see a picture, or at least I do. So let's draw this as a heat map, and um, we'll do that. Ratio equals one to get my nice uh, heat map. Um, just needs to compile. So, so what we're going to say is that the agents cannot move, right? This is a very different idea. Well, not very different, a bit different from what we've been doing. So the, so the agents are the yellows, right? So I know the colors are not great, but let's not worry about that right now. So the agents are the yellows. So which agents can interact with each other? Well, only the ones that are next to each other, right? That's, that's the rule we're going to impose. Only, you can only transmit the infection if you're touching somebody, north, south, east, or west. So like these two here, a diagonal touching diagonally, they cannot infect each other. Only this one and this one, which are touching vertically, can infect, and this one and this one. So if I infect some agent to start with, how many people are going to be infected? Only the ones that are touching that person, right? Touching through some chain, right? The infection can propagate through a chain. And so what I'm actually looking for are what are called clusters, clusters in this, um, in this grid. 
Right, so here there's like one cluster of two people here, one, one here, and one here, and that's all. So what do you think happens as I increase the density? So I, there I had a density of one tenth. Let's suppose that I now have one tw uh, two tenths, two, one, one fifth. Well, obviously, um, well, I have you know, more people infected. So of course, what I want to do is an interact, right? So you can do an interact. I won't do it right now. And what, what are you going to find? So if I put this up to something like 0.45, oh, look, we're starting to, you know, so here there's still not very many big clusters. But as, the num as this row increases, I'm starting to get these kind of big clusters where everybody could get infected. But still, everybody here is infected, but, but nobody over here can get infected because they're not touching these people, right? So this is a problem that's very classic in physics, mathematics, called percolation. This is site percolation. And the question is, when will I get one giant cluster that spans from one side of the system to the other? So if you think of these as coffee grinds, uh, coffee grounds or whatever they're called, Right, if I put these in my espresso, espresso machine, the question is, can water pass from one side of the system to the other by following, uh, by following one of these clusters? So this is the same question as, can an infection pass from, you know, can an infection cross my country from one side to the other? And the answer is, well, if I use a row that's big enough, you have to find, you know, what is big enough? There, yes, a, an infection can pass all the way across, right? Actually, uh, in this particular case, it's not true. But you know, basically, you're sort of able to fill that, uh, which is weird because it's yeah. But that's what happens when you have a finite system. It, 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 you know, you can pass all the way from right to left. Let's say, right? You can go from here all the way over here, all the way over here. You cannot go from top to bottom. It turns out in this particular example. Let's just run another one, and probably you will be able to. So there's some probability that you can go from top to bottom, right? There, I can go from top to bottom. So this is percolating. Right, so basically I have one giant cluster, but then I have some small pieces, maybe like these, these guys here are isolated in their own cluster. So I have some probability distribution of sizes of clusters, which you can calculate actually, right? So exercise, write an algorithm that finds all the clusters in the system. Right? That's a pretty neat little, uh, little exercise to do after finals are finished. Uh, in fact, I almost put it on the problem set, but I decided it was a bit out of the context of the course in a way. Anyway, it's really cool. It's a really cool thing to do. So do that. And there are, you know, it's not obvious how to do it. It's not obvious how to make it efficient, actually. Okay. So now if you let, the, if you were to let these guys move around a bit, then you can see that, okay, then I can start joining up these clusters, right? So this is like perfect social, perfect distancing, perfect physical distancing is they cannot move around. So they can only touch the people that are right in their house, basically. Right? But if you let them just go outside a bit and go and walk down the road or round, round the block, then they can suddenly interact with other people. And so you're, you're, what are you doing? You're actually adding new links, right? So what I have here is basically a network, which I'm not drawing, which is I'm not drawing explicitly, which is there's a, like a dot at the center of each of these cells. And there, there's a line joining it with the one that's next door in the north, south, east, and west direction. And if I go and let them walk around the block, then I add a new link that's joining this one to this one. And that means that I can actually, you know, spread to a whole new cluster of people. So basically I'm, yeah, I have this sort of dynamic network that's evolving in time that, it, that by adding new links between different parts of the network actually allows the, is gonna allow the infection to propagate more. And so basically, you know, networks are now used all over all kinds of areas, social sciences, especially, um, I don't know, anywhere, you know, the, the network of airline uh, f uh, of flight pathways between different countries, for example, which has now been destroyed, but it used to be, you know, uh, a very interesting network, etc. So networks are used all over the place, but you, and you can see that why they're used in epidemic modeling. Okay, so, so how would I represent all of this in Julia? Okay, so so if you, if you already know the answer, then you know, don't, don't answer, but how can you represent this information? So basically you want, so one of the things you could do is sort of number each of these guys, right? So this is number, agent number one, this is agent number two, and they happen to be at these positions. And so I want to know, you know, who are the neighbors 
of agent number one. That is the key piece of information, and that is what my network is going to tell me. So how could I actually store that information in Julia? What would be a useful way of storing that? In other words, what would be a useful data structure to store that information? Let's have answers in the chat. If I can actually find the chat window, as, as usual. Okay, there we go. Thank you. Oh, I see that was for something else. Yeah, so the answer to um, why we rewrite the Imperial College model in Julia, if it's not for performance, is because it will make the co code actually clean and understandable because it isn't right now. That's what I want to show you in a minute. It is really difficult to understand and badly written, basically. So it's an example of code that, you know, from a long time ago that is not written up with modern standards of software engineering, basically. Yeah, okay, great. So you could use a dictionary or an adjacency matrix to encode the edges. So what does that mean? So yeah, I need to know who are the neighbors of agent one. For example, you know, agent one is in contact with agents two, seven, and 73, right? So how do I represent that information? So as you say, I could use a dictionary. So it's like D, and let's call it contacts, is a dictionary which maps integers to integers. And so I want the contacts of agent one to be the list. How do I do that? Uh, no, so I can't use a dictionary, right? Oh, how would, how would I use a dictionary? Maybe I'll just make it an untyped dictionary for now. So uh, yeah, so how would, I, how would I actually write this? So agent one maps to, how do I do this? Contacts of one, yes. Contacts of one equals, and then what am I gonna put? I have to put this collection somehow, right? So there's various ways I could code that in Julia. So the simplest thing I could do is just use a vector. Right, so that encodes the information that the contact of one is this list of people. Or I could use a set, right? So contacts of person two is gonna be a set of these things. I'm not sure if we've done sets yet, but anyway, it's just another data structure. And the point is it's an efficient way, it has an efficient way of checking if somebody is in here, right? Because what I'm gonna to need to do is check, is this person in contact with this person? If so, then do something, right? And so that's one of the things I'm gonna to need to do. Or I'm gonna need, yeah, or I'm gonna to need to iterate through all of these and say, do for each neighbor do something. And so I want something like, I wanna be able to say, is three in the list of contacts of one? And the answer is no, is you know, two in the list of contacts of two. Okay, so that, that was a mistake. I'm not supposed to have contacts with myself, right? So that's, uh, I mean, there are some cases where you might want to say you have contact with yourself, but let's, let's say that we're not. So two should not be in the contact list of two. And by the way, I can use backslash in tab, and it'll give me this nice uh, mathematical containment uh, symbol, right? Okay. So that's what I'm going to do. Uh, so one way you could do this, one way we could set this up is actually not use a dictionary at all. So you could just have contacts could be a vector of vectors. And so it's going to be something like the first vector is the list of contacts of one. So it's two, seven, and 73. And then the second one is a list of contacts of two. So it's four, seven, and 73. Right? And then contacts is a, a vector of vectors. And so contacts you know, two is now that vector of contacts. That's one way of, of doing it. So yeah, as you said, this is called an adjacency, well, you actually maybe didn't say that. It's called an adjacency list, I believe is the correct term. So um, it's a list of all the people that you are adjacent to, you know, that you're in contact with. And so as you said, you could use a matrix instead. So I could actually re represent this as a matrix where I have zeros and ones just like up here, right? So you can think of this as, oh, this is a different representation that's different from what we have here. So um, yeah, well, we can just do another one. So rand of int, so an alternative is, is this. Oh, come on. Uh, sorry, rand of um, zero and one. So uh, this is going to be an adjacency matrix. So which people are next to which other people? So um, 
you know, four is next to one because there's a one here, et cetera. And so you probably, so yeah, okay. That's another representation, but you can see that there's gonna be a lot of zeros if people are not in touch with very many other people. And so that's gonna be an inefficient way to store the information if it's sparse, right? If there are very few contacts for each person. So if there are a hundred individuals and each one is only in contact with about three, then it's very inefficient to represent it as a matrix. So it's a bad idea. But you want an efficient way to say, is person I in contact with person J? And so a matrix is better for that because you just jump straight to there and you see if it is. Whereas here you have to do something more clever to check if you're inside. So, you know, which data structure you use can really affect how efficient your code is, as you probably all are aware. Okay, so that's just, um, uh, just a brief introduction to network. So there's a package in Julia called light graphs, which enables you to do this. So light here means like, as in not heavy. So sort of a lightweight graphs. Um, so you, there's this graph type. So uh, let's, I hope I can remember how this works. So you, you make an empty one and then you do add vertex or add vertices sort of five and that'll add, and then, I need to tell it where to add the vertices to. I'm gonna add five vertices to the, the graph G. So now G has five vertices and zero edges. Now I'm gonna add an e edges, add edge between G, from G between one and two, for example. Okay, and now G has one edge in it. So let's draw that. So I'm gonna use a, a package called graph plot, and then I'm gonna do G plot of G, and it should actually draw that in a nice way using some algorithm that basically tries to push push the vertices apart and then join them at edges in some, some way. There's lots of different algorithms to draw graphs. There are various different packages in Julia that do it. I just chose one that, that I've used before. So here we are, there are five edges and one of them, then two of them have a, a link between them. It's not very easy to see. Let's add another couple of edges. So G2 to three and G3 to three and, and G1 and three. And so there you can see that tiny edges between the, the graphs, right? So yeah, There's, I think you can configure this stuff so that it draws it a bit more nicely. But anyway, you can see that um, you can, you can. so there's various uh, ways you can um, generate graphs in this package. For, for example, there's something called an erdosh Renyi graph. So we make an erdosh Renyi graph with 30 nodes and probability of 0.3. And we'll call that G and then we'll plot that g plot of g and that's the kind of thing you can do there's a nice graph with 30 nodes and some number of edges right so there's all kinds of different ways you can construct graphs so like there's a grid type um so how do you use that i don't remember anyway whatever grid oh, oh i see light graphs dot grid of um three four false it told me to use a tuple. What? Tuple? Dimensions or just a tuple? And then periodic. Oh, okay. Just three, four. Okay, G equals that. And I'm just going to do a G plot of that and it'll give me a nice grid, right? Etc. So, um, okay, so we know how to represent, right? And then what can I do? So if I look inside G, what do I find? It has an adjacency list, forward adjacency list. So I'm doing G dot tab to see what its fields are. And let's just look at that. So actually, I think um, uh, neighbors, neighbors of one, for example, neighbors of one inside the graph G, it'll tell you the list of neighbors in the st same structure that we just had, right? So basically G dot forward adjacency list is exactly just a list of, uh, just a vector of vectors. Okay, just like we just said they might be. So that was a, a choice that they made is not, not always the best choice, but that's a pretty good choice. It's not always the best choice because if you want to check is 17 in this list, you actually have to run through the entire vector and check each one, right? So that's an order n operation where n is the number of things in the, in the vector. If it were a set instead, that would be an efficient thing to do. But sets have their own problems because sets are not ordered. Right here, there's an order. They're actually stored you know, in increasing order, right? So then that is advantageous for some algorithms, et cetera. Okay, so that's a um, quick introduction to networks in Julia. So now what, do we, what, what can I do with these networks? I wanna do some dynamics, right? Basically, in my opinion, you know, network, some, lots of people study networks. I mean, there's, there's a vast field now, but they only become interesting when you have some dynamics that's actually occurring on the network. 
So the simplest kind of thing you could do is, well, let's have a random walk, right? So let's suppose that I have some body here and it's going to jump to one of its neighbors, right? So it looks, how many neighbors do I have? And then it jumps. It chooses one of those at random and jumps there. That's the simplest thing you could do, that's simplest dynamics. And um, that has some interesting properties that you can go and study as an exercise. And um, yeah. And depending on the structure of the network, that will behave in different ways. For example, what happens if you have a very, you know, one node that has a lot of connections and some other nodes that have few connections? Will it spend more time in some place than another place, for example? Maybe it will. And then, okay, now suppose you look at this graph and you say, oh, look, that looks quite a lot like the United States of America, right? Maybe these are the state capitals and maybe these are the interstate highways joining them. Now I have an epidemic on my hands, what's going to happen, right? So suppose I have an infection in Alaska and these are, you know, plane links to the US and, um, so there's an infection here and there's some probability on each of these nodes that uh, or there's some you know rate at which planes are flying between these nodes how is that infection going to spread how fast will that infection fed how or how many much time do i have you know over here in california or wherever it is that uh until the infection reaches me right all these kind of questions suddenly become answerable once you have this kind of context okay so let's very briefly look at the Imperial College model. So, um, so you go to this uh, GitHub link, so mrc-ide slash covid-sim. So you can just look up like Imperial COVID sim, right? Sim for simulation. So, that, and there's um, actually some document documentation, which is not bad. It's, I mean, it sort of gives you a broad overview, right? So there's one called model overview. So let's just look at that. So what is the structure of this model? Even there um, at the start of this course. Right. They um, got yeah, so thanks. Yeah, publicly requested to, by many, many people to put it online and they, and yeah. they did. Yeah, so actually they, yeah, they had some people clean up the code and put it online and that's good. What's not good is that they should have been online from the start, you know, and also we're, we're about to see that the quality of the code could be improved. Oh, I so, was going to say when you were showing off and talking about uh, uh, Jupyter notebooks, I mean, the, the operative words are reproducible science. Right, right. Definitely. It, it, it's become very clear to me that the, the norm in, in science and engineering, which is you do some research and you write a paper and um, maybe you, you don't put the code online, maybe you just put some graphs that were produced by the code. It's, it's not sufficient because it's somehow, you can read the paper a hundred times, you never know every little detail that happened yeah. and it's impossible yeah. to know. Yeah, yeah and, the only and, way you can know is if you have exactly the code that exactly does exactly what you do. Yeah. Exactly right. <laughs> yeah, otherwise there's all these little details that, you know, how many individuals did you start with that were infected? Oh, but there was this little extra thing that we did that we didn't tell you, we forgot to tell you or whatever. That's all in the code. Not to tell you, we didn't even think that you'd want to know. Right? Exactly, yeah. You probably don't want to know, but if, but, as, but you know, until you actually try and write your own simulation and then you have this list of a hundred questions of what little detail did you do there and what, how did you solve this problem and how did you eliminate that? So, so the um, operative words are reproducible science and um, if you do in your own work come across a paper where there is no code available, um, I, I, I give you full permission to, to, to bug that person, make, make them feel bad a little bit. Yeah, definitely. Uh, because you yeah. see, even, even if the code is ugly or not yet fully ready, you can put it online and then other people could come along and make right. it nice and yeah. usable. And that's a good yeah. thing. And that's what we've learned in this open source world that as soon as you put your code online, if somebody is interested in it, they might come and help you improve it. Okay, and that's happened with our package, you know, my packages that I've written, people have come along and, you know, made serious improvements to the packages with some better ideas that they had about how to do something or, you know, just because they spent more time writing documentation and, or whatever. Okay, so, so what is this? So, so this is, you know, really one of the top models in the world right now. So what does it look like? So uh, just very, 
broad overview. So, so they, the, you, so it's just like our model from problem set four. You have space. You have you care about the fact that some people live in you know California and some people live in Boston, and those people are less likely to meet each other, right? Unless there's something called a plane, uh, an airplane in between them. So. You, you, so the space is divided into cells and the cells are divided into mini cells called microcells. And then you have, and, but it's an individual based model. It's exactly like we've just been, we've been doing in the problem sets all along, right? Except the, the last problem set. Right? So they also have an SEIR differential equation type model, I believe, that they use for different things. And oh yeah, that was something I wanted to say. So on this, on this network that we just did of the United States, you could actually, at the, each point of the network, you could, have the, you could have an SIR model describing the dynamics in that city. And then those SIR models could be coupled by this network. So that's something that people do as well. That's called metapopulations. Right? So each thing is a population and then a metapopulation is like the collection of all these populations that are interacting with each other. And the network describes the strength of the interactions, which again model how many planes there are that fly between them or how many buses, whatever. Okay, so there are people, there are individual people, and they have houses, and the houses have a location in, in space. But the people, as I said, do not move around. So the way that they interact is by a network. So they have to invent a network of how these people interact with each other. And people have institutions like offices and schools and campuses. And then you have some probability distribution that tells you how you, you know, interact with your workplace and with your school. And that is taken from data. That is the really, as I was saying, that is the key point about this model, I think. That they really have access to a lot of data and they know how they should integrate it into the model. And that is actually the difficult thing, not just writing the model down. And um, okay, then you know, people have infections and they infect, basically they infect sort of in some sense, they infect the supermarket and then the supermarket has some infection around that it then infects the people who visit it with. I believe is what they do roughly. And that's it, that's the, that's the model, right? And then again, the whole problem of the modeling comes in, how do you actually describe the, you know, what is gonna happen to the people? And so that's in this other um, description called intervention description, right? So this is like, what happens when you distance people? What happens when you, they wear more masks, et cetera, right? So there's all these like quarantining households and, um, closing schools, etc. And so let's actually go and look at some code, right? So it says uh, you have various interventions or they control how infectious people are or how susceptible other people are. And it says interventions are given by changing things using this weird thing called hash define in this file called model macros.h. So let's go and look at that. So you go to the code uh, tab over here and you go to source src and you go to model macros.h, and this is actually looking at the code. Now, one warning, open source code has different license restrictions. So if we just go back to the code a minute and we look at license.md, it says that this is the GNU general public license, and this is a strong copyleft license. That means that if you use any piece of their code in your code, you have to release your code under this license. So if you release your code, then you have to use the same license or something that's compatible with it. And that is a strong restriction on what you can do. So just by looking at this code almost, we're sort of polluting ourselves. And so if we ever use these same ideas or like copy their code and use it in our, in our own code, then we will actually have to use their license. So that's a negative thing. And that might be a reason for not wanting to look too closely at this code, but let's look at it a bit. So. So they have these hash defined. So this is C++ code. I'm not going to teach you C++ right now, but basically it's a way, it's, it's, it's like a method that they have to do what we would do in Julia with other means. Basically we would just define these as normal functions because that's a thing we can do in Julia. So, you know, um, is the host treated? So X is going to be like a person is, a, 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 yeah, is like a, a host in the sense of a host of, a, of an infection. So a person. And so there's some collection of vector of hosts. And we're looking at one of them. 
And it has, you know, it's like a struct and it has some thing inside called treat stop time and you're checking some condition and this is an and and you're checking, checking some other condition. Or so it's just, you know, is that host being treated by some, uh, using some treatment, right? Using some uh, vaccination or I don't know, no, va vaccinating, vaccination is down here. Is, is that person having some, taking some kind of medicine that's supposed to help with the infection or, you know, I don't even know exactly if that's the correct interpretation, but you get the idea, right? And then, so let's go back. And, uh, and now, um, if you go and look at the documentation again, it said to look at that something or other happens in calcinfsusc.cpp, right? So first point is that these are terrible, um, terrible file names because that's really difficult to understand. Second point is that in C++, you always have to duplicate all the code, which is totally ridiculous. Uh, you have the same file name with a .h as a header file. It just defines the, um, the, the, the signatures of each function. And then, um, then you go into this, fun this, this .cpp and that's the actual code, right? So basically in Julia, we just get rid of half of, half of those files immediately. Now, if you look at this code, not too closely again, this is how infectious is a house, for example, right? So, um, and you see that there's some conditions Okay, so you have to go look at what it's exactly doing and it's just saying, oh, if this condition, then you reduce the infectedness or whatever, infectiousness of the household or something. And now if you look at this code and then you look at this code, you'll see that it's almost exactly the same. So they have a whole load of code duplication. And as I've tried to insist in this whole class, this is a very, very terrible idea. And, you know, just looking at this code, it just looks nasty. It's really unreadable. It's, you know, they're duplicating all the code. And they're basically, because they basically what they have is, oh, they have a, some infectiousness of a house and infectiousness of a school and infectiousness of a this, and they're treating them all sort of separately. Whereas actually that's the same idea, just repeated again and again. And so basically you would, you just want to clean all that up in Julia or in some other language, but in Julia, want to clean all that up and sort of just make some more generic, more sort of easy to use uh, way of doing this. It's not completely clear to me how you would do that. You have to think about it, isn't that? Right? Designing your, the structure of your code is usually the hard bit, actually. But um, and that's, you know, what they, and it also depends on your language, because if you're just writing it in C, then you do have to do this stuff because you don't have these kind of nice high level features that we have in Julia. But now we have this in Julia, we can, we can use it. So that's the idea of rewriting the code. I can reduce this to, you know, some, maybe not shorter piece of code, but just more, more in, intelligible piece of code and usable, right? So, um that's a that's that's it so you know so basically what they have is effectively a network of people who are fixed in in space they they have some kind of spatial location and then they have links to other people that are that they get from data right so they know how much population is there in each part of the country that comes from some website somewhere cool. um and then they say oh these people, you know, there's this distribution of ages of people in, the con in, in that part of the country. So for example, oh, in that part of the country, there are a lot more children because people have children because it's an agricultural region and people have children earlier in life, for example, right? And then the children will have schools where they interact. And so then they have information on how many schools are in that part of the country. And they, they don't actually model each individual school, right? They don't know where the schools are in the country and how many students go to, go to them, but they have some kind of more statistical information and they kind of create artificial schools that somehow reflect that distribution of, of um, that, that distribution of, of data. And so that's, that's where a lot of the difficulty in the modeling is, right? Not really in just writing the code. That's not in a way so difficult, right? You just use all the techniques we've been seeing through the course and you add a bit, a bit more and that's it. So the difficulty and you know, why you need to be an, a top epi epidemiologist to, to, to do a proper model is that they really have thought about how to sort of represent all of these uh, features in a, realist, in a much more realistic way, right? But once you've done that, it's just what we've been doing. It's just the infection spreads. And now instead of spreading by moving, it spreads by you know, moving along, the no the, along this, um, this network and that's all, and you just do a, a simulation and then you do another one, and you do another one and you take an average, just like we've been doing, have a Monte Carlo simulation on the network of dynamics of this infection. And that's it. So that's, um, that's all they do. So it's, it's very neat that, you know, it's a very good idea. And the fact that they, you can 
accumulate all this data and put it into the model and then make predictions um, is very nice. But the code quality could be improved a lot. And in particular, you know, if you use a nice high level language, that is still, so you could say, oh, well, I will do it in Python, but Python's going to be too slow to do these simulations. So you want to do it in some high level language that's also fast. There are no, you know, there are not that many such languages, and Julia is, is a very good contender for this. This is exactly the kind of thing that Julia is perfect for, this exact kind of simulation. I mean, a lot of, sim, a lot, a lot of kind of simulations, but you know, this simulation, Julia is, is really the best option, in my opinion. Yeah, maybe we can say that, uh, you know, very often in, in, you know, early classes, your goal with a, with a program is to get something to work. Right. And you could learn sort of the math behind, uh, you know, or the structure behind. Yeah, and that, but, that, was, that was really our goal in this class as well. For sure. And, but then um, as one gets more sophisticated, you want to build things that other people will help you build and join in on and also be um flexible for other people right and you know so many more things that and that that's what julia is going to allow us to do well and be fast right and be as fast as the computer that you're running on it will allow you to be so um maybe a couple of closing words are, are in order first yeah. of all uh you're you're, you're all going to get a little um token a memento from the course in the mail and the snail mail um a Letter went out today uh, to your to the home addresses on file. So assuming that you are either wherever your home address on file is or can get access to there, then um, there'll be a little a little memento from the class, just a little token. But you could look forward to it arriving in the mail in the next few days. Um, let's see what else. What other closing remarks? Um, you want to get <laughs> Philip? To, <laughs> My son's going to go get the third professor in the room if he's willing to come. Well, just that uh, we hope you uh, enjoyed the class and that it's been useful and you've got something out of it and that you can um, you know that it'll be useful for future your future work or future jobs or uh, for sure. research or. We're uh, glad you took the class. It was all a last minute kind of experiment in a way, but it, we got it to work. Um, you all did great, and um, you know certainly when 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 things fire up again. If you're around anytime, come and visit us. Yeah. So, all right. So take care, everybody. I guess with that, we'll, we'll close off. Yeah. All right. Bye. Bye, everybody. Take care. Be well. And if you want to come and work, you know, on these, these projects, then just let us know. Yeah, there are three projects. There's the Imperial College is one of them. Um, and there's, uh, another COVID uh, project with Christian Caucus and a climate project as well. So um, if you're interested in any or all of them, please let us know. All right, take care, everybody. I'm going to sign off now and have a good summer. Bye-bye.